Hello, and welcome to another in our occasional series on local history. I'm John Beekman, manager of the New Jersey Room, the Jersey City Free Public Library. I'm going to be joined today by Joseph M. Murray, historian, voice actor, and producer. Joe is no stranger to us here, having done programs both live and virtual for us in the past, showcasing the three-part documentary he created, covering the end of the long mayoralty of Frank Haig and the complicated politics of the years that followed. Today, he's going to share some research on an earlier key moment in the career of Frank Haig. In late 1937, Jersey City's powerful mayor and political power broker faced some of the fiercest challenges of his long career. Deteriorating relations with organized labor, especially with the CIO, would culminate in violent clashes over the right to rally and organize on city streets, leading eventually to a Supreme Court case that began a redefinition of First Amendment rights. Having seen the Democratic candidate for governor, William L. Dill, go down to defeat for a second time in 1934, Haig surely felt pressure to deliver an electoral majority from Hudson County, especially as the candidate was his friend and political ally, A. Harry Moore. And deliver he did, to such an extent that accusations of voter fraud and ballot manipulation, certainly not unusual in his career, seemed to gain some traction. As we recorded and debuted this video in the days prior to Election Day in 2022, accusations of a stolen election are, of course, familiar to almost all of us. Uh, without litigating those more recent claims, Joe presents his findings on whether we might call the 1937 New Jersey governor's race the real stolen election. So hi, Joe. Thanks for coming by virtually to talk about your research into the 1937 New Jersey governor's race, uh, which you described as the real stolen election in an article that's currently in submission for the New Jersey Studies Journal. Thank you, John. Great um, to be here. Thanks. So, but I think first you're going to give us a little background on machine politics and the uh, the machine of Frank Haig in particular. Uh, this is something we've we've talked about in the past. Um, yeah. But today I believe you're going to focus on on the business side of the Haig machine, which is I think something that bears uh, closer attention. So I appreciate that. Um, so with that, I guess I'll pass the virtual floor over to you. Uh, I believe you have some visuals to accompany your talk. So I do. Uh, so we'll get those on the screen and uh, you can take it from there. Well, good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be part of this continuing series where we seem to have an infinite interest and fascination with all things Frank Hay. Now, in, in researching the article, it was impossible for me to escape a deeper dive into some aspects of the Hague machine that perhaps are not given sufficient attention. And a lot of it draws from Jim Fisher's excellent work on the inextricable link between Frank Hague and the waterfront Port Harbor rail economy of Jersey City. I believe the topic for the museum that's gonna happen, the opening that's gonna happen, John, am I jumping the gun here? But I believe you actually build it as who is this man, Frank Hay? Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's uh, one, of the, one, of, one of the hooks on that because I think it's uh, that, that image that you have and there's a couple others that are similar, um, really pose the question in a visually arresting way. So yeah. It, indeed it does. And there's some interesting details about this particular image, number one, it's in the New York Daily News, but it's advertising the New York Post. I found that to be rather curiously incongruous. And the other thing to note is that it's Haig's birthday. January 17th is Frank Haig's birthday. So this, this wonderful expose was somebody's idea of a birthday gift for, uh, for the mayor. But when we think of Frank Haig, of course, we always consider him to be a pre preeminently a politician. And my contention is that he's not just a preeminent wizard machine politician, but he was one hell of a businessman. And he was in fact a business mogul. And the more you delve into this, the more you realize what made him such an effective machine boss 
was his ability to draw upon the resources of his business empire, which in many ways is unique to Jersey City because of all the things Jim Fisher talks about the extraordinary situation of the Jersey City waterfront and the port economy or the political economy of the port, as Jim describes it. And that's really what I think makes Hay a business mogul. And he actually described himself, if you view this quote the way I do, as a businessman as much as being a politician. He harks back to the Tammany Hall slogan that business and politics are essentially the same. There was a guy by the name of George Washington Plunkett, who was a, Ham a Tammany Hall politico. And he, he would say the biggest problem with reformers is they don't understand that politics is a business and that it's a full-time job. Haig understood this, I think, intuitively. And for him, politics is and was a business. And if you regard it as a business, then you have to accept the fact that it's all about making money, which he was able to do successfully in a number of ways. First of all, I think he was at heart a monopolist. He was the kind of guy who had to be, I guess in modern parlance, we'd call him a bit of a control freak. His hands were on all levers of government. And he had a monopoly of government, starting with Jersey City, moving his way up to Hudson County, and then ultimately, had a virtual monopoly of, I think, the government of the entire state. Now, that's probably a bit of a radical thing to say, but the research into the 1937 election very much draws one to that conclusion. And his ability to monopolize government was very much drawn from his control of the port economy, economy of Jersey City, as well as his ability to monetize public's public works projects, both before and after the New Deal. And we'll get into that in a moment. And these two combined made him a bit of a patronage tycoon. So he had not only political patronage at his disposal, but he had all sorts of patronage opportunities arising from his control of the port economy, whether it be in unions, whether it be with, with the loading rackets, which we'll also discuss in a moment, all these favors were at his beck and call and were his to give or take away, which gave him enormous influence and quite literally enormous power. Draw all of that together and you, and you come up with the democratic machine, which I argue is much more than a democratic machine. It was a Hague political syndicate that was statewide and encompassed both political parties. You'll see the term Hague Republican, and we'll talk about what that means and why it, it substantiates this contention that he really did run a political syndicate, especially at the height of his career, around this time, 1937, 1938. You find Hague at the, at the apex of his political power and authority. Now, of course, coming from Jersey City and Hudson County gave him a decided advantage because Hudson County had kind of a a chip on its shoulder. And he was able to draw upon this idea that they're different from everything else, everybody else. They're different from New York, even though they shared the same Hudson River Harbor, they were not considered an equal to New York. So that gave them a chip on their shoulder. They were apart from the rest of the state because it was largely immigrant, largely Catholic, and for a great number of years, predominantly Irish. And it was a one-party state. It was a state within a state. The tail that wagged the New Jersey dog is the phrase that I actually used in the article at one point. And the one-party rule of the Democratic Party is indispensable. I would actually go so far as to say that it ruled both parties in Hudson County, insofar as the Republican Party was emasculated to the point of subservience. And then Haig, Jim Fisher, Fisher can talk about this much more than I can in, in more depth and detail established a Irish Catholic moral order and some interesting aspects of how the church is operated within Jersey City in particular. The de decentralization of the church, including the Catholic church, kind of made Haig almost a pope or a bishop-like figure in that moral order. 
And again, he played upon this us against them mindset, which Jersey City in particular had always demonstrated uh, going back to the days when it was ruled by Republican elites outside of Jersey City. And then he drew upon this very, very substantially and vocif- you know, in, in an emotional way during this, during this episode in 1937, where in fact, it was Jersey City pitted against the state of New Jersey in Hudson County, taking its position of defiance against the state, state legislature as they attempted to investigate election irregularities in the 1937 election. So the business, the business monopoly that Haig was able to preside over was all due to the unique position of the Jersey City port and railway waterfront economy, or ecosystem, as I often refer to it. There was nothing else like it in the world, literally, uh, certainly not in the United States. Was, it, this was at that time the busiest port in the world. So for a politician to have the tenure that Haig had for 30 years, to be able to preside not over not only politically but economically over this thriving hub of activity, um, and the fact that you had seven plus railway companies coming to a dead end halt at the Hudson River shoreline in Jersey City gave Haig incredible authority and influence that no one else really was in a position to wield. And as Jim Fisher likes to point out, the reason why all those rail terminals came to a it came to a dead end in Jersey City is because they never built a freight rail link between New Jersey and New York, right? And that meant that everything that came into Jersey City from throughout the United States that had to go into New York and beyond had to be offloaded from the rail ports, from the rail depots, and then put on floaters and lighters to be taken over to New York. And that created an opportunity for the waterfront to become much more than it ordinarily would have been had there been a freight rail tunnel. So we've talked about all these major railways having terminals in Jersey City and investing heavily in the activity required to transport what would be deposited in Jersey City, or some might argue held hostage in Jersey City, so as to to, to be forwarded on, freight forwarded on to New York and beyond. And that included cargo, fresh, fresh produce, everything that had to go to New York City, had to go through Jersey City, and had to be blessed in a way in order to get loaded onto the ships and to the floaters that took the rail cars and the cargo over to Manhattan. So Haig was able to do this because he had a joined at the hip relationship with a gentleman by the name of Bill McCormick who for years was not identified as as a known commodity, but he was indeed the Mr. Big of the Hudson Waterfront. And a lot of this came out during the 1950 Crime Commission investigations into the waterfront and just how important and how completely enmeshed into every aspect of port activity Bill McCormick was. He came from Jersey City. He grew up in the horseshoe. He was 10 years younger than Haig, but they were very, very closely allied, both Bill McCormick and his brother Harry were indispensable to Haig's ability to operate as a supreme political and economic figure over the New Jersey waterfront. And it actually gave him influence on the other side of the Hudson as well, because McCormick was in complete control of all the stevedoring interests in both New Jersey and New York. And this relationship continued throughout the entire reign of Haig, so long as the, the port remained the economic dynamo that it was, it benefited both of these guys, both financially and politically. So let's take a look at the main sources of revenue for the Hague machine. We've already touched on the waterfront. Every transaction that took place involving shippers, stevedores, truckers, the loading rackets in particular, and of course the union, the ILA, the International Longshoremen Association, everything that happened in all of those domains entailed a profit that went to McCormick and Haig. Kickbacks, shakedowns. It's very, very hard to put to quantify a figure that estimates the annual income. I've kind of put my finger up in the air and said, I think it's got to be somewhere within the range of one to two million per annum. But out of the testimony of some of the figures involved in the Waterfront Commission investigations, 
this phrase came that it was a take beyond estimate. The amount of money these guys were able to extract from, from waterfront activity at every level was huge and almost impossible to calculate. So suffice it to say that this made a lot of people rich and this also made a lot of people beholden to Haig and McCormick and the, the business empire of the machine to basically allow the port to operate. And again, it all stems from the fact that you had this infrastructure defect of no freight rail tunnel going from New Jersey to New York. So everything had to pass through Jersey City and everything did so at a price. There was a negotiation involved in every aspect of, of the rail and, and port activity that took place at the waterfront. Second source of income is more traditional to machine politicians, public works infrastructure. Now, let's take a look at what Haig was able to do even before Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president. These are three of the largest things that Haig was principally responsible for, or at least instrumental in bringing about. From top to bottom, the Holland Tunnel. Even though Haig, this precedes his, his being mayor, but in 1916, he was very much a factor in getting a guy by the name of Walter Edge, elected governor, and with Nucky Johnson's assistance from Atlantic City, the Republican boss from Atlantic County, the two of them colluded to get Walter Edge elected governor and the quid pro quo exchange for that political support was that the Holland Tunnel terminate in Jersey City. It had other options. It could have gone to Weehawken. It could have gone to where the Lincoln Tunnel later went. Could have gone to Hoboken, but it went to Jersey City. And the consensus among those who dig into this stuff is that that was principally due to Haig and Nucky Johnson's deal to get Walter Edge governor. So how would he make money from that? Well, they had to clear the whole section of the horseshoe that the Holland Tunnel emptied into. And property values escalated as a result. People bought the land up on the cheap and then sold it on the high. And Haig was very much involved in that. The same formula applied to Journal Square, which was his vision. He filled in that railroad cut and created Journal Square as a commercial hub for Jersey City. Uh, one of our one of his most enduring landmarks next to the medical center. And he made significant amounts of money from that, some of which was investigated in 1928 during the case uh, committee hearings. And then finally, again, before FDR came on the scene with the New Deal, the Pulaski Skyway. Haig was involved in every aspect of the Pulaski Skyway, including small things like there will be no trucks on this freeway, right? Um, he, he got involved in every aspect of the Pulaski Skyway, including the construction contractors. There was a big, um, Stephen Hart examines this in his book, The Last Three Miles, where there was a big controversy between uh, Brandel, Theodore Brandel and Haig. Brandel was a big union guy who brought work to a halt because of a dispute with Frank Haig, which I won't get into, but Haig was involved in all of the aspects of the construction and the contractors who fulfilled those construction contracts for the Pulaski Skyway, and no doubt made significant, amount, significant amounts of money from all those related transactions. And then once FDR comes on the scene, of course, you have a federal patronage bonanza with the New Deal programs that we can quantify. As much as $450 million over a, uh, an eight-year period was channeled into Hudson County because of Frank Haig. Why? Because Frank Haig was the single disperser of New Deal funds for the entire state. Think about what that means and think about how that gave him leverage over the Republican Party, particularly in the, in the state Senate. So these particular landmarks or monuments to bossism, as I often refer to them as the medical center, the Jersey City Armory, which opened in 1937, I believe, or possibly at the end of 37, because his great uh, Red Scare speech was made as one of the inaugural events at the Armory in 1937, 38, excuse me, January 38, and of course, Roosevelt Stadium. All of these were funded by WPA and other New Deal programs that came to New Jersey and came to Hudson County and Jersey City because of Frank Haig. And the relationship with 
FDR becomes crucial to the story of the 1937 election, because even though FDR had some serious misgivings about Haig, he was absolutely dependent upon him, especially once Haig proved that he could bring New Jersey into FDR's camp every time FDR ran. So he ran in 32. He narrowly won New Jersey. That win clearly had a lot to do with Haig's ability to deliver the vote, to deliver the vote, especially from Hudson County, but from the Democratic concentration in the northern part of the state. That was doubled down even more in 1936 because FDR had a landslide. And that made him indispensably important to FDR. And as a result, he was rewarded with all the New Deal funding through the WPA and through the other agencies that were set up as part of the New Deal. And a significant amount, almost $500 million came into, into New Jersey, Hudson County, in Jersey City uh, during that period from 32 to 40. Again, uh, this, this headline here shows not only the, um, the dependence that FDR had on Haig, but his willingness to support Haig. Came to Jersey City, Haig brought out the crowd in spades. Over 250,000 people gre greeted Roosevelt. Uh, in, in, and there's not that much footage available on this, but the photos of the period show uh, an unbelievable turnout uh, as FDR came to lay the cornerstone for the Jersey City Medical Center. So just going through these quickly, these are some of the key figures that Haig had relationships with that, that ensured him the New Deal funding that he desired and that he put to good use for Jersey City and Hudson County. Uh, Farley, who was, by the way, the chairman of the DNC and who was the vice chairman of the DNC, Frank Haig. Harry Hopkins was, was a key guy at the WPA who ensured that Haig was happy and Haig worked with him to get the medical center in Roosevelt Stadium built in particular. Now, something that I hadn't really fully appreciated before, but it changed the political dynamic and made FDR even more dependent on Haig once he decided to seek a third term, which was unprecedented. No other president had ever sought a third term. FDR chose to do it sort of quietly, and there was actually resistance among the leadership of the Democratic Party, but the 1940 convention was held in Chicago, and Haig's good friend, Ed Kelly, was mayor of Chicago, and both Haig and Kelly collaborated to get the draft Roosevelt movement going, and actually it took flight, and FDR largely due to the efforts of these two gentlemen, was able to get the nomination and ultimately won a third term. And of course, later on a fourth term. <clears throat> so the relationship with FDR was purely quid pro quo in the sense that Hay could muster the vote. And this very uh, unflattering cartoon kind of segues into what we're gonna talk about in, in reference to the 1937 election. And that is that Haig shown here as Gabriel blowing his horn in heaven and causing a resurrection of all those deceased to come out of their graves and vote for the Hague candidate of the day. And that is precisely what happened in 1937. And we'll look at the details of that in a moment. So the upshot is that FDR relied on and accepted the fact that Hague was a political wizard that he was able to achieve political metrics such that no one could really compete with. 92% of eligible voters were registered. Of course, that figure is even higher, as we'll see, uh, when you look at some questionable uh, voter registration practices. Virtually everybody who was registered voted, and even more so. Turnout always exceeded expectations. And the heart of the 1937 controversy was bloated voter registration rolls, which um, becomes pretty much the heart of the story in terms of the bone of contention between the Republican legislature and the Hague machine once they actually try to investigate this. Bear in mind that there were no voting machines in Hudson County until they were imposed by the state in 1944. Coincidentally, by a Republican governor who came to be governor a second time after a 20-year hiatus, Walter Edge. 
So let's look at the 37 election in particular. A guy that most people don't know about, Lester Klee, was the Republican candidate. He was advanced by the clean Republican movement led by Arthur Vanderbilt. He came from Essex, Essex County. He was a state senator at the time. And he was also a reverend. He was a Protestant uh, clergyman. So he had a, a flair for oratory. He was a very strong and serious candidate that caused concern for Haig. Haig didn't really have that many people available to put up against someone like Klee. So what did he do? A. Harry Moore at that time was a U.S. Senator. He had served as governor twice before. He was quite content being in Washington and quite uh, settled in as a U.S. Senator. But Haig yanked him out of Washington and said, no, I need you to run for governor. And he ran for governor seeking a third term. So Clee versus Moore is, is essentially what uh, the 37 election was all about. Again, Hudson County proved its mettle. It delivered a 45,000 vote plurality, which completely vitiated Clee's 80,000 vote lead. Now, you know, we're not even going to get into absentee or mail-in ballots. The fact of the matter is that Hudson County was always the last county to report its vote total. So people went to bed the night before thinking that Clee won. And then in the morning, Hudson County magically produced the necessary plurality to put A. Harry Moore over the top. Now, this figure is, is very much a part of what caused so much heartache for the Republicans, that the actual vote count of Jersey City seemed completely skewed. So 145,000 votes from Jersey City alone versus what the Republicans and others tabulated should have been something like 120,000, even under the most robust assumption of turnout. So if you assume that 90% of the people turned out who were registered voters, you couldn't possibly get to 145,000 votes. So there were suspicions all around. There was reason to be suspicious um, once people started digging. And shortly after the election, the Republicans wanted to do a recount, which they did. And then all of the all of the wheels of the Hague machine started to turn to essentially thwart the investigation or any attempt to understand the voting process and practices in Hudson County. And Haig brought to bear every ally he had, and he had plenty of them, including the judiciary, the chief justice, including the state attorney general, including his judges on the Court of Errors and Appeals, and especially the Bureau of Elections in Hudson County, which was run by Republicans. Hence, the understanding of how Haig controlled the Republican Party in Hudson County. They were, in many cases, Republicans in name only. They were operatives of Haig's machine. So uh, Haig not only got the governor that he wanted, but he also backfilled uh, more in the U.S. Senate with his longtime lawyer and fixer, John Milton. For a brief period, he filled out the end of, of Moore's term. Now, something that I was not acutely aware of until I got into this research was the fact that there was a third party candidate who was actually a schismatic Democrat who happens to be my grandfather. James F. Murray Sr. ran as an independent Democrat on an anti Hague ticket. Um, admittedly to be a spoiler candidate to draw votes away from A. Harry Moore in Hudson County. Uh, of course, he was not successful in his ambition to do that, uh, nor, in his, he, nor did he seriously think he could win. So it, it, it's quite believable, that plausible that he was in collusion with Vanderbilt and the clean Republican, uh, the clean Republican movement of Essex County, to actually function as a spoiler to help tilt the race towards Clee by drawing votes away from A. Harry Moore in Hudson County. Now we're gonna actually take a look at the votes that Murray was able to accrue. And you're gonna immediately see that things are, are somewhat rotten in the state of Hudson, okay? Because Murray secured a 
paltry 392 votes in his native hometown of Jersey City. Five years before, he polled almost 30,000 votes in his second run for the city commission. And then, of course, 12 years later, as part of the freedom movement and the freedom ticket, he won 73,577 votes. So how could you possibly come up with a figure of 392 votes from Jersey City? His, his immediate band of followers would have come to at least 1,000 plus, um, if not more. He estimated that he should have gotten close to 20,000, which uh, everything I've been able to research concludes as a reasonable estimate as to what his expectation was. Haig sandbagged him big time, right? And that's just one dimension of the voter fraud. Obviously, the Republicans felt that the fraud was staggering as well because they saw how much more Democratic vote was given to A. Harry Moore in this election than was given to the Democratic candidate in the previous election, William Dill, right? So suffice it to say that there were some serious questions hanging over the vote counts, and in particular, the registered voters of Hudson County. And that became the thrust of the investigations that followed. Regardless of the recount, regardless of the uh, attempts by the Republicans to actually prevent A. Harry Moore from taking office until there was an investigation, he was sworn in on January 18th by Supreme Court Justice Thomas Brogan, who was a Hague operative. Both of these men owed their entire political careers to Hague. So what the article gets into is the recount that took place immediately after the election, which failed to really achieve any significant gains for Klee. I think he only got like 820 votes uh, as a result of the recount that were added to his column. What they really wanted to get to was the voter registration records because that therein lay the evidence that would have shown that this, this election was subject to institutionalized voter fraud in Hudson County. So the court investigation never materialized because Brogan, as the, as the court, as the justice of the Supreme Court pres presiding over both the recount and the court investigation, he scotched it. He basically said there's no grounds for a court investigation and he straightjacketed the recount so that they could only count ballots. They could never look at registration data. So every step along the way, the Republicans were prevented from seeing any registration records, anything having to do with voter registration, even though they did find some evidence to suggest that was some serious foul play there, but they were not allowed to investigate and look deeper into it. And it got very contentious. It almost came to uh, physical violence when the Young Committee investigated or attempted to investigate the registration records, as we'll see in a moment. So the committee that was formed, so they were all of their opportunities to investigate the, the election and the registration data were, were blocked. So they were left with only the recourse of pursuing it through the state legislature, which was dominated by Republicans. The Republicans controlled the Senate and the legislature. But strangely enough, the state Senate was lukewarm about any investigation and never really supported it. And in fact, they never even approved the funding for it. So the state assembly had to proceed on its own and pursue the investigation, which was headed up by this gentleman, Henry Young Jr., also from Hudson County, uh, excuse me, from Essex County and a clean government Republican. So essentially it was the Young Committee representing the Republican majority in the state legislature that came head to head with the Hague machine. And they, and they presented this as a New Jersey versus the morally and, and legally corrupt Hague Democratic machine of Hudson County. They wanted voter registration records revealed. They wanted to look at them. They were blocked and thwarted at every turn. Uh, so much so that they actually, Haig and, and, um, and machine officials dispatched uh, a coterie of, of armed Hudson County police to guard the vault at the Bureau of Elections. And the election official, a guy by the name of Charles Stobling, 
uh, was mysterious, mysteriously ill for the whole period, so he refused to release the records to the committee. The committee actually came to Jersey City and attempted to break open the vault. They brought a safe cracker. They brought um, the sergeant of arms and a whole security detail, and they actually were at the tip of each other's swords, as it were, uh, against the Hudson County police that refused to allow them in. And it almost became a brawl, an armed confrontation with the committee members and their security team and the machine police that guarded the vault and refused to give them access. Pretty dramatic stuff. Now, all of this took place at the same time that Haig was launching his Red Menace campaign. So 1937, 1938, that period shows Haig at the peak of power. And it's also two weeks after the 37 election is when he made his famous I am the law speech at the Emory Presbyterian Church in Jersey City. He was intoxicated with power, in my opinion. And he was brazen and actually completely unconcerned about any consequences. So he went full throttle against the CIO, full throttle against the state legislature in defying them and their desire to examine election records and registration, the registration rolls in Hudson County. He just stonewalled them. It was, it was a grand case of obstruction. Now, I won't get into it because it's, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this discussion, but it might have been a tipping point. I mean, this is where Haig now became vilified as the Hitler on the Hudson. And you'll see that in this in the series of, um, of Art Deco kind of cartoons that came out around that period, largely driven by his fight with the CIO. But all these things had a cumulative effect to make him, you know, the Hitler on the Hudson, the Democratic bad boy, uh, to the point where it was becoming an embarrassment to the White House. And then, of course, in 1940, there was the Senate probe that wanted to resurrect what the state legislature wasn't able to do and they too sought the, the registration, the voter registration records from Hudson County. And guess what? They had been destroyed. They were burned by City Hall and unable to be produced uh, to the US Senate Investigative Committee in 1940. They only wanted the 37 election records and those re election records had been destroyed uh, with no explanation given other than they didn't need to keep them any longer. Even though they had the 36 data, they destroyed the 37 records. This also led to um, Vanderbilt working with David Dayton McKean to produce that famous book uh, about the boss, The Haig Machine in Action, which was a hit piece. I mean, it largely uh, vilified Haig and tried to do so on a national level. So all of these things combined started to worry FDR to the point where FDR, I think, was secretly, privately, cautiously looking to see if there was an alternative to Haig. And he put forward Charles Edison. Edison was his Navy secretary at the time, a native of New Jersey, the son of the great inventor. Uh, he kind of took Edison and said, Haig, run this guy for governor. And amazingly, Haig did. But as soon as Edison was elected, he said, I'm my own man. I have nothing to do with Frank Haig. And he was the only governor, either Democrat or Republican, to really stand up to Haig and start to challenge him. And the way he did that was choking off state patronage to Hudson County, which infuriated Haig. And then I think from that point forward, you start to see things conspiring against Haig generally. It took a number of years for him to finally have his influence wane, but these incremental steps pretty much brought him to where he had to retire in 1947. Voting machines, as I mentioned earlier, were introduced in 44. Every election up until that point was paper ballots, hand signed. Um, uh, every voter would sign against his registration records. And these are all the things that they refused to share with the committee and they, they made certain that it never got public. And then FDR died in 45 and Truman succeeded him. And that pretty much ended, not pretty much, it definitely ended the cozy relationship with the White House. And you see here, Haig and A. Harry Moore, circa 1937, 36, uh, at the White House, enjoying an audience with FDR. Truman was not a big fan of Haig, even though he himself was the, was the child of a machine, 
the Kansas City machine to Pendergast. He didn't like Haig. <clears throat> so Haig begrudgingly supported him. Um, and then the new constitution that came in in 1947 spelled the end of an era of Haig being able to, through his machine, control the courts and the judiciary. And then, of course, once he retired in 1949, his nephew, Frank Haig Eggers, was defeated in the election for city commission, and that brought John B. Kennedy to power. So what are the research highlights that I drew or that I was able to uh, obtain from, from pursuing this subject and digging into the material to write this article? As, I, as I've already covered, Haig was at the pinnacle of his power in 37, 38. I described his bossism on steroids. He really did not care what anybody thought about what he did because he was almost impervious to opposition at that point. We already discussed the symbiotic relationship that he had with FDR and how FDR breathed new life into the Hague machine from 32 onwards. The Hague Republicans that I, that I referred to also covers both the collaborators within Hudson County who might have been Republicans only in name, and it also hints at the very cordial relationship that he had with his Republican counterpart in Atlantic City, Nucky Johnson, who was a boss like Haig, and they found common cause and they colluded in gubernatorial elections, although there's no evidence to show that there was open support for A. Harry Moore over Klee. There's sufficient evidence to suspect that Nucky Johnson would have been quite happy to see A. Harry Moore win the election. But he, there's no evidence that he worked openly like he had done in the past with Haig to ensure the defeat of the Republican candidate. Haig was able to do what he did in 1937 and earlier because he had absolute control over the election apparatus in Hudson County and sway, if not control, over the state judiciary. The rogue Democratic spoiler candidate attempted to take some votes away from, from A. Harry Moore in Hudson County. Haig made certain that that was not only a failure, but that it was an embarrassment. He really tried to mortify James F. Murray Sr. to basically get rid of this burr in his saddle who had always been uh, a political annoyance to him. Interestingly enough, uh, it was the new governor, Edison, who appointed James F. Murray Jr., Hudson County Registrar, as a way to demonstrate his independence from Haig and also to spite Haig. So, the heart of the story is how the Hague machine obstructed any attempt to investigate the election and to prove that there was, in fact, massive institutionalized election, election fraud that benefited A. Harry Moore and tipped the election in his favor. That's pretty much it, John, in a nutshell. Um, all right. Thanks. Thanks for that. And uh... Folks who are interested in reading more, we anticipate we'll be able to do so um, if and, and when, we presume when this uh, article passes uh, through the peer review process uh, and, and into the publication in the uh, studies, New Jersey Studies, the Interdisciplinary Journal, um, a successor to the New Jersey History Journal for which you wrote an article some years back. Uh, yes. How would you, how would you, compare the process of uh, writing a, an article for publication in today's uh, digital world. electronic digital world to the, to the process of, of writing from that one was, oh, we won't do the math to think about how far that one was in, that was in 84, 85 time yeah. frame. You're, it's a fantastic question, John, because the research techniques um, vastly different. Certainly so much more could be done remotely because everything's, not everything, but a fair amount is digitized and available um, remotely as a, or virtually as opposed to actually digging through the archives. I did do some of that as well. I did go to the Historical Society to look at, at the Murray collection, particularly to understand my grandfather. And I, I did find a couple of interesting things that supported the research for this article. But by and large, being able to access all the newspapers of the period, not all, but you know, the principal ones, including I consulted many of them from outside of Hudson County. 
you know, I didn't just go to the Jersey Journal and the Hudson Dispatch, et cetera. I really went all over the state uh, where anti-Hague sentiment was pretty strong. You know, we, you tend to realize or, or not to appreciate how hated he was outside of Hudson County. And it sort of supports that whole idea that Hudson County, us against them, there really was an us against them mindset in Hudson County. And there was a them against us mindset outside of Hudson County, uh, led largely by the the Vanderbilt wing of the Republican Party that just found Haig to be, you know, nefarious and Hudson County to be an embarrassment, um, an embarrassment politically and an embarrassment to the state. And they were determined to try and expose Haig, but he was just, at that point, he was in a position of invulnerability almost. You know, I was, um, we have a copy of a speech that, that Haig had given in 34 when he went down to South Jersey ostensibly to just support Dill, but also to just defend his own regime, which got me looking at the fact that, I mean, this uh, Dill, is it George Dill? I forget his first name. But, uh, uh, William. William, William Dill. Dill lost the governorship twice uh, during, you know, Haig's uh, time as Democratic power broker. And, I, and I'm sure that must have been uh, on his mind as he pulled out all the stops for his friend A. Harry Moore in, in 37. But why do you uh, I don't know if you'll know this, but why why um, why wasn't Haig able to do it for Dill? Was it just the the times, or was he not uh, quite as invested in Dill's success, or were there some other things going on? That's um, a brilliant question, and I am not alone in this contention. He didn't want Dill to win. He had a very friendly, cooperative relationship with. Uh, Harold Hoffman, who did defeat Dill and who was the sitting governor at the time of this 1937 election. Uh, he was a Hague man and he was despised by his Republican, the clean Republican faction for being uh, in Hague's pocket. Uh, and I think we actually looked at some statistics here. Look at the difference. So no. Moore secured almost 130,000 Democratic votes in Hudson County. Whereas Dill only got barely 90,000. That's that's almost a 30,000 vote delta difference for Dill. And everyone was convinced that Haig preferred Hoffman because Hoffman would be easier to do business with, right? And Hoffman did work with Haig. And mm -hmm. as a result, uh, incurred the, the ire of his Republican colleagues and was not renominated. In fact, he was, he was uh, somewhat disgraced within the Republican Party. And strangely enough, when he tried to make a comeback uh, in 1940, his campaign manager in Hudson County was this guy, Charles Stobling, who was the principal Hague Republican at the Board of Elections who prevented access to the voter registration records. So, you know, the the one takeaway for me that was really an eye opener was how Haig owned the Republican Party in Hudson County, uh, to the point where there was almost no real Republican Party in Hudson County. They were, they were subsidiaries. It was a subsidiary operation to the Haig machine. You've uh, titled the article "The Real Stolen Election," which is clearly an <laughs> allusion to uh, recent events that we, yes. we won't necessarily go into, but but uh, maybe the old fashioned idea that you could call up a political operative and say, give me 30,000 votes, uh, you know, has possibly some grain of truth back in uh, in this era and uh, when the the dead could vote in Hudson County. And and the way that works is, is, is I finally came to understand, it wasn't that, you know, somebody was putting on a fake mustache and a wig and voting a second time under that name. It would be that somebody, what we today would call an undocumented person, might use the identity of a recently or not so recently deceased registered voter um, and thus be able to, to vote. I mean, there was some of, of that, at least traditionally. No, although... you're right. And in fact, the Republicans did prove isolated incidences of the use of floaters, right? People that would just go from one election district to another, being given names by the machine of registered voters and masquerading. Remember, it was all, it was all paper ballots. So it was very easy to do. And then there were blatant irregularities of votes being changed, 
And the lore at the time, when I was a kid growing up, my grandmother, who was the wife of James F. Murray Sr., said, well, they just dumped the votes in the river. Everyone knows they dumped thousands of, of your grandfather's votes in the river so that they would never be recorded. And when you look at these figures, it's kind of hard not to think that that's probably what happened, right? Um, so it is the real stolen election, because if you're going to pursue institutionalized voter fraud, this is the model. This is how it would be done. Right? Now, of course, it's easier to do it on the state level than it is on the national level, right? But uh, there was no attempt that succeeded in the courts, right? Unlike the current situation in 2020, where there were 60 or so um, attempts to actually get the courts to look at a voter fraud, which um, were unsuccessful, right? And the attorney general himself saying there was no evidence of voter fraud to justify the belief that the national election may, the outcome would have been materially different. That was not the case in 1937. There was ample evidence, but it was evidence suppressed and evidence withheld from those seeking to investigate and prove the irregularities. And, uh, and then ultimately, it was destroyed, right? So they, it, it's almost comical. I mean, you have to read the, uh, the interviews or the, the transcripts from the, the U.S. Senate hearings, and they get this guy Stobling, right? The, he was the commissioner of registration. They get him on the stand, and the Republicans are shaking their heads in disbelief and saying, you mean to tell me you don't think there's ever been voter fraud in Hudson County? And then they present him with examples that were, you know, patently obvious. And he said, well, okay, if one guy voted 30 times, obviously that's something that, uh, that isn't proper. <laughs> and, and I think, I forget the name, I think it was Senator Tomey was his name, I believe. And he just said, thank God you're no longer in office. Right. Um, so it was, it was sort of like a well-known secret that this is how Hudson County operated, but how do you prove it and how, because it was never legally established that this was the case, right? There was no, Haig, to the best of my knowledge, Haig was never forced to admit that there was an election um, that, that could be overturned as a result of evidence of voter fraud. Mm -hmm. just, just never happened. And this one, if any election should have been proven to have been affected by fraudulent voting, it would have been this one. But again, his stranglehold over the court system, and it did go all the way up to the errors in appeals court. And um, the dissenting opinion of the three Republican judges was written by none other than Judge Case, the same guy who was a senator in 1928 who pursued the Case Committee. Right. And, uh, uh, and there's some great testimony if you read and get into that taste case committee uh, testimony. Uh, entertain, little, entertaining views on retail politics of Hudson County of the era. Most assuredly. <laughs> one, one other thing I'll leave you with, and, and it's, it is explained further in the article, is, well, two things. First, the, le the legal argument to invalidate the committee, because in effect, what they did was they completely delegitimize the committee so that no one had to respond to the subpoenas. The subpoenas were thrown out of court. They tried to, to, um, to subpoena election officials and the judges said, well, you have no basis for this. You have no authority. You have no authority to issue the subpoena. So at first they were saying that the young committee had no authority because it was, it was only authorized by one house in the state legislature. It was not a joint committee like the case committee was in 1928 of Senate and and assembly. It was purely a committee uh, authorized by the assembly. And then secondly, they said, you are usurping the judiciary. By pursuing this investigation, you are usurping the role of the courts. When in fact, they had gone to the courts and the court says, you have nothing here. There's, there's no there there. So we're not going to waste our time looking at it. Right. It's, yeah. it's pretty amazing stuff. And it was done with, the, with a certain degree of, of daring and sophistication that just boggles the mind. And so. the other, uh, the other, the other echo of of today that uh, that I was I was I was hearing because you mentioned, you even used the phrase Republicans in name only, which which today is is a favorite <laughs> thing for 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 anybody to you know for 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 some to describe any politician not sufficiently uh, far, you know, to the right or however you want to put it, you know, yeah. like that that 
it's these days, I think Richard Nixon would count it as a Republican in name only, name but, only. but here Ronald in Reagan Hudson did. County, at the, yeah. Uh, but at the time, you you would literally have you know uh, this 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 case of Republicans who are just you know uh, working in the election, you know, in name only. So it's well, you had if I if I may just roll on that because it's an important point. You had two classifications. You had Republicans in name only. Actually, I use that phrase without realizing the contemporary relevance. Uh, and then you also had Hague. You had Hague Republicans. And then you had one day Republicans, mm -hmm, right? The Hague Republicans were the guys that were basically machine operatives, but were registered Republicans and actually Republican officials, ser supposedly serving the Republican Party. Well, then you had the one day Republicans who were Democrats masquerading as Republicans to vote in the Republican in the primary primaries, right, and yeah. bring about the candidate, the outcome that Haig sought by usually with Nucky Johnson wanting one Republican over the other who would be more accommodating to boss interests, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the final irony I'll leave you with is that the real stolen election of 1937, the sides are reversed, right? It was the Republicans claiming that the election had been stolen by a challenger, right? Actually, uh, you know, it's just ironic that, that the machine was the one actually suppressing the vote, if you will, by inflating the voter registration record, suppressing the Republican vote. You know, so you kind of have a, a reversal of situations here where um, without wanting to get into contemporary politics, you just had a recognition here that that's how Hudson County operated. It was a different entity under almost a different political system. And that's just how things were done. However, it had statewide effects. Sure, if they want to run their municipal elections that way in Hudson County, okay, fine. But now you've contaminated the entire uh, body politic of New Jersey. And so A. Harry Moore was, was in a derogatory sense referred to as the governor of Hudson County, right? Because he was basically, he was a Jersey City born and raised Hague minion, right? And uh, uh, then Nelson Johnson openly refers to a Harry Moore is a Hague puppet. I didn't go so far as to say that, but it's it's an accurate portrayal. He was. He was. I called him Hague's front man. Mm -hmm. but, sure, sure. Not uh, not unwillingly, you know. But they're just simpatico. And uh, so, well, I think uh, I'm not even going to go into the the first half of the talk, which which laid out so much. Uh, great stuff about Haig's business, but I think you and I could probably keep talking about this um, for another hour or more. And I didn't uh, mention Harborside Terminal. Haig, <laughs> Haig was the architect of Harborside Terminal. Right. So, you know, he did a lot of incredibly beneficial things for Hudson County economically, but by the same token, uh, he was also adamantly against the Port Authority. So when the Port Authority came into being, um, a lot of what they wanted to do was opposed by Haig and by McCormick because it threatened their whole empire, right? It was a competitor, sure. uh, sure. by state agency that was going to uh, depoliticize the operation of the port. Obviously, the guys who were making fortunes from the port the way it was running as dysfunctionally as it was were going to be against any any reform or improvement. Right. But then once in place, they, they think they learned how to do business uh with it but another topic for another day um thank you john and so appreciate yeah it. i appreciate uh working with you and you taking the time today absolutely enjoyed it thoroughly as always all right thanks take care